Hey there, folks. Welcome to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My guest today is Laura Terrell. She is an executive coach. She's worked in a lot of very cool organizations and industries, including one role as a special assistant to the president at the White House. Laura, how are you today? I'm great, Anthony. It's great to be on with you. I'm excited to chat. I know now uh, after or through that varied career, now you're focused on being an executive coach and helping people be uh, successful in their own domain. But why don't you tell a, list, a little bit about you and uh, what keeps you busy? Sure. Well, I have a background as a practicing lawyer. As you mentioned, I was a special assistant to the president of the White House. I've been a partner in two very large global law firms. I also now work as the general counsel of a small nonprofit in addition to my coaching work. I've uh, worked for a publicly traded company as in-house counsel. I've been a business advisor. I'm also an active angel investor with a lot of startups that are women owned or women supported. And I just have a variety of interests. I think that has always characterized the, the fabric of what I do. I like getting outside my comfort zone. Uh, being a lawyer can be a little bit stiff, I think, sometimes for people. And people think, oh, you know, the lawyers, they just like to say no. But I, I didn't feel that way as a lawyer. I still don't feel that way as a lawyer. I've always liked being engaged in people's business, getting to know clients, what matters to them, um, just getting to know people generally. And one of the things that led me to executive coaching after 25 years in business and law was I really wanted to be able to connect with people and hear what mattered to them. I always enjoy listening to what's on people's minds about their world, their life. And I've been through a number of different environments. I've seen a lot of things. And so when someone says, this really bothers me, or this is really um, tough and challenging for me, a lot of times I can say, yeah, I know I've been there. That, that I, I like to validate that people are going through something that's hard or challenging or tough and be able to work that through with them. So uh, I guess in many ways, I just like engaging with people and getting a sense of them. And I've always had an opportunity to work with some really terrific folks. Awesome. Uh, have you ever written a book? I have not. I do blog a fair amount. I have a couple of book ideas, but I don't have anything that I have done yet. Okay, well, with, well maybe this might be a spoiler, but I ask because... I find that those that wrote a, would write a book about something, and I've never asked this question before, they have a question that repeatedly gets asked of them. And so instead of just repeating it over and over and over again, they put it in a book. So I guess my question to you is, in this story experience that you have, what is a question that you find yourself answering over and over again? Uh, how? What is the most frequent thing people come to you with because you are an expert and a specialist in that domain? This is not going to, maybe not a great book title, Anthony, but a question I get from people all the time is, am I crazy for thinking this? Am I the only person that's going through this? Am I nuts to think that this is a problem? And I think people often feel alone and they feel isolated. So when they say, am I crazy? Am I nuts? Does this not resonate? Am I imagining things? No, mostly you're not imagining things. You're just expressing pretty normal human reactions to something that may be terrifying or challenging or scary or depressing. And I encounter that a lot. So I like to think that if I had a book title, I guess it would be something to address the fact that people are not alone when they grapple with issues in life. Perfect. You're not alone and you're not crazy by Laura Turner. You're not alone but, and yeah. you're not crazy. So you've given me a better title already. There we go. So uh, how does that... Um, you know, question come up, if I think of like a, a someone in law and someone who does advising, you know, people come to you with sometimes their most challenging and most complex things. How do you um, either help your clients or what have you done in the past to help people process or help them with that thinking process? Do you have a, a an approach that you use or, you know, how do you deal with complex situations and seemingly crazy ideas? Most people come to me with an idea of what it is they want to work on in coaching, and they just want some support and maybe some accountability to keep them moving on it. But often I find the issue that people come in and present, maybe it's, I want to get promoted, or I want to switch companies, or I'm really unhappy in my job, but I don't know what to do about that. That issue often is not the key area we end up working on. I like to ask a lot of questions because sometimes when somebody says, 
I want to be promoted. I asked them, well, why? Why do you want to be promoted? What's what's intriguing about that? Uh, I want to be paid more money or I want more responsibility. But sometimes as we start working through what it is that's appealing about a change or a pivot, somebody says along the way, you know, I'm I'm not so sure. Maybe I don't want the managerial and the admin or I don't know that this is the right company for me to do this. So there's not a role that's going to open up. So maybe I should look elsewhere. It's not that I dissuade clients from pursuing what they tell me is their target, but I like to hear why it's their target because it helps me better understand where they're going and how they want to get there. And it helps me also better support them when they might get frustrated along the way, or they might find something that is more appealing to them than what they initially talked to about. Got it. So uh, if I take some of your experience around like with what you did with Golden Seeds, how, how did you support the people that were coming within um, that organization? How did you help them uh, figure out what their uh, you know visions were and what they needed to work on um, so that our listeners can have some practical takeaways that they can use for themselves? You know, Golden Seeds is a great organization. It's an angel investor group. As an investor, I was really learning, I think, more from the people that were coming in, actually. It's a little bit of reverse for me because as a lawyer, rather than someone in the investment banking or the investment advisory world, I didn't have as much knowledge. So I was trying to figure out often, hey, what do I need to know about this company? Or what do I think of this person in the role of CEO? Where are they going with this? How does this fit into what I see as trends? And also, who else can I ask about this? I am a big believer in looking for resources. And whatever job, whatever role you're in, whether it's being at the White House or running your own small business, you've got to find resources to help guide you along the way and answer the questions that you don't know the answers to. And I don't think there are very many people that just know the answer to everything and never need to consult somebody, never need to ask, how do you get this information? Or what would be a good you know, debt ratio for this company? What do you think this company should be doing with the cash it has? Should it be raising for the next fund for its next round of investing? Those are questions I learned to ask. So I felt like I was actually in the learning seat there. And I often feel that I'm in the learning seat regardless of the role that I'm in. But I think getting the right people around you, and I learned that from Golden Seeds and from other positions that I've been in, I learned having the right people around you and having the right team to meet different needs, to meet different skills is really critical. Cool. So let's, if we think at the end of your tenure there, or even now, what would a good team look like? So let's say there's an organization trying to grow and scale or somebody who is trying to, uh, you know, move out of the CEO seat into kind of like the board chair seat. What are some people that they should surround themselves with to support that good decision-making? Well, I think one of the things that companies, especially when they're trying to scale often mistake is that the CEO is doing everything. And I see that a lot of times. I see that in big companies. I've seen that in big publicly traded companies where the CEO is also trying to be the chief of staff, the chief operating officer, the chief business development person. You can't do all of those things effectively. Uh, Whether you're in a, a startup that's trying to scale or whether you're in a larger company, you need the right people around you. I've worked with a lot of startups, a lot of entrepreneurs. And one of the things I I try to indicate to them when they ask me questions as general counsel or in a legal capacity is, you know, that's not really something that, that you need a legal advice on. You need somebody to help you with that from a financial planning standpoint, or you need a risk management officer or a compliance officer to look at things like that. So I think, you know, fundamentals in any organization, you've got to have a core team with a good financial mind. You've got to have a good CFO. You really need to have a good development and sales person to run that that arm of your company. You need to have good legal and compliance advice, particularly on the compliance side, if you're in a highly regulated industry, such as many in the US and Canada. You've also got to have somebody that is really looking at your operations. And I think I've seen companies that lack a chief operating officer, somebody who's knitting it all together. The CEO is providing a lot of vision, a lot of overall strategy. But your operating officer is looking at how that executes on a daily basis and also how you're delivering on the goals that have been set forth and what needs to change or or move within that operational structure. So I think those are some fundamentals and some cores. You mentioned advisors. I think it's really good to have a good set of advisors. One issue I do sometimes see is that 
companies and CEOs want advisors on the board who are friends or people that they know well. And, and that can be good, you know, that you can have some people that are terrific within your network, but I don't think you want just people that are going to validate what you think. And particularly if you're in a space that you've got a lot of risk involved, maybe you're in a biotech startup, maybe you're doing something that is crypto or cannabis focused. You want some people that are really knowledgeable about the industry you're operating. How are you going to get financing? What are you going to do with regard to regulatory change? Uh, what are you going to do to scale quickly? What are you going to do to be able to withstand an economic downturn when interest rates are up and your cash flow is limited? I think having knowledgeable people and seeking people that are outside your network that can, can challenge you and challenge your company is just as important as having people that say, hey, I know this person. I feel good with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that, uh, I don't want to say that holds true, but the balance between the best people with the most specialized expertise, typically those people are expensive. And then you have a lot of organizations doing the best they can with the resources they have. So what would you say to a, a leader or a CEO who's in that the need to have those great people around them, but then is still kind of in the bootstrap scenario and needs to figure out, you know, just how to make it work. Any thoughts for that? I think the first thing you do is identify the skills or the or the knowledge that you need in somebody on the board. Let's say you have a pretty good board of directors, board of advisors, but you're really missing somebody that understands uh, some of your employment scaling and how you're going to be able to manage your hiring and how you're going to be able to get good people in, incentivize them maybe with equity, maybe with shares. Somebody that understands that, if that's your priority is to really get somebody that can help you think through those issues, question whether you need a great head of HR or whether you need somebody in a board position that can do that and ask yourself where that balance lies. I think looking for the skills and the qualifications you need first and then trying to identify the right person. Might be somebody, as you say, that is highly specialized, very expensive. So you might need to go to someone else. You might need to find somebody that fits some of that portfolio. But I think you shouldn't just say, you know, I need somebody really good. I've been told you need somebody that's in this role or this is the best person. Identify first what it is that you and your company need. What, what are the, the core qualifications that you're looking for in someone? And then start thinking about what the, the landscape looks like. And that includes reaching out to your network, reaching out to other people, who can do this, who would maybe be available for this on a part-time basis, who would be available to do this in conjunction and work closely with my head of HR or some other role. Got that. Um, so I'll change ch change paths a little bit because you talked a lot about, you know, it, well, if we focus mainly on your role as an executive coach and how you would advise those folks. But if we take it back to your experience, you know, one of the things I could see from your career, obviously, you, you know, made your way all the way up to partner and did all of those things. So as it relates to kind of navigating the corporate world or being able to be a successful partner, um, if someone was trying to follow in your path to kind of climb the corporate ladder, for lack of a better term, uh, what are like two or three pieces of advice you would give them to kind of shorten their learning curve since you are the expert on that subject? Well, I'm a big believer in taking opportunities. And you can see I've had a lot of jobs and some people might say, well, that's a lot of different career paths you've been on. And could you not decide or did it not seem you know, consistent to stay at one and really invest? From my perspective, I was always looking for opportunities to learn and grow. I'll give you a great example. I had an opportunity uh, when I was in government after I was at the White House to stay in another role in government, which sounded really interesting to me. And it was very much in line with what I had been doing, but I also had an opportunity in the private sector. And one of the things that was appealing on the private side was I had not substantially worked on the private side. And I wanted to figure out how you run a business and how you build a business. Uh, government's a very different operation. You're working in a very different environment. And for me, it was not just about making more money or um, being able to you know, invest more for retirement. It was really about just learning how to build that business. So I found somebody that was looking to augment uh, their stable of attorneys at their law firm who had, I think, a really great business mind. And I saw this was somebody that could teach me about business and could teach me about running a law firm. A law firm today is a complex business environment. It's not just your old, everybody put a shingle out, be lawyers together. 
you've, you've got to be able to run multi-million, in some cases, billion dollar enterprises, multi-billion dollar enterprises. And I want to understand, how does that look? What does that business model look like? How is it changing? How is how we price services changing? How do we account for the cost that we put into this? Because it's very different than a lot of other institutions. And for me, that was an opportunity. Um, I've had other opportunities since then, including to go in-house and work on the other side as a lawyer, really getting to know the business of a company that is in, not in the legal business, um, that is providing non-legal services. And that was just another intriguing piece of understanding a different part of business. A lot of that has taught me a lot about running my own business as a coach. It's really enabled me to better understand how I can market, how I can brand. Those are things I didn't also understand earlier on in my career. And I wish I'd really embraced. That's one thing I emphasize a lot with the people I talk with is figuring out what's your brand and start with your reputation, start with your knowledge, and then start figuring out how you grow your brand from there. I think that's a lot easier now than it was a number of years ago without the prevalence of social media. You can really create your own brand, even if you're in a company and you're not the most senior person, you don't have a profile on the website. What are you doing to get your thought leadership out there? What are you doing to put yourself in places where you can learn? So as you can see, I'm really about the chance to go out and find things that you find interesting and that help you grow, not necessarily just the progression up the ladder. Although I have no issue with that. I've done that as well. But I think it's a it's it's always important to think be thinking, what do I want to get to? What do I gain or lose if I move to this next role or this different role than I have now? Yeah, so I, I definitely hear the need to be strategic in one's career, uh, both from an endpoint perspective, but a kind of step by step perspective. And then I also heard you say um, that you value having a diverse set of skills and abilities that you could bring to the table. And while it might not have been at the time branding like we know it now, visual, social media, all the rest, that it sounds like you built your CV and that was your brand that you were able to bring into organizations, whether that was government, for-profit, not-for-profit, and, and able to bring that into, you know, whatever organization that you're working with. And I also hear, you know, specifically with the legal uh, business and the side of things, like it can be a very, very complex enterprise. And the undertone of what you said is just, you can't just be a good lawyer. You really have to do all of the other stuff. And I think that that applies to kind of every industry. So to sum everything up, you said is say, Hey, you have to be really good at what you do. You also have to be good at other stuff and fill in the gaps with the rest because you can't do everything. If I synthesize our entire conversation. You are great, Anthony. You synthesized really well. Yeah. An advice I give to a lot of clients is you can't just be a good lawyer. You can't just be a good salesperson. You can't just be good at one aspect. You got to be thinking kind of more broadly about what do you want career-wise? What do you want personal-wise? And how do those things fit within that? And that might mean you need to take a more active role in managing your work, managing your role in an infrastructure than just being focused on your job and head down trying to do good work. Absolutely. And I think that's the evolution of the business climate that we're in because it's especially competitive. Uh, you have such a broad talent base and everybody's looking for the leg up. And I saw that I want to say it was McKinsey, but one of the big consulting firms, uh, the one that has who CEO is a DJ. Don't quote me on that one. And I saw a guy who said, you know, they had the last 50 people that made it through the, like the internship and how they competed who decided was at the end of a beer mile so i cannot confirm if that is true or not but they wanted somebody who was able to drink beers and do late nights so it shows the uh importance of having a diverse skill set in whatever you're doing so uh laura as we finish up any words of advice or wisdom for our leaders in the room and then where can they connect and learn more about you just that I think in the environment we're in, being really aware from a leadership mindset of what's important to your people and how you can meet their needs is really important. I don't mean that in just a uh, general, you know, be nice to the employees you work with and make sure they have flexible time and they're able to work remote. Those are very popular things we read about now, but I think employees really want their leaders to have a much closer sense of what's important to them and the dynamic in the organization. If, for example, you're requiring people to be in the office three days a week, 
but nobody's in the office connecting, nobody's talking to each other, everybody's in on different days and you can't really get work done. You might wanna ask your employees if they find that meaningful, if they find it helpful to be in the office or what would be helpful if they were in the office. I think a lot of the one size fits all policies that we're seeing coming out of a post COVID environment, which involve saying to people, we need you in three days a week or working hybrid is fine or no, we need everybody back in the office are good in theory, but as a manager, you've really got to be connected with your folks to understand what's important to them, what's important for your business goals, and how you try to find a match between the two of those so that organizationally you're able to function in a way that people are happier, people are more satisfied in their work, and better able to get to the the, the milestones that you're looking for them to meet. So that's my general view right now on a few things happening in the workplace. If you want more information about me, um, I'm at lauraterrell.com, L-A-U-R-A-T-E-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate you being here. I think that there's something to learn from everybody here as they look at whatever next stage they want in their career and business and to make sure that they have a, a good balance of breadth and depth, but also the importance of building a team. So thanks for sharing with us today and I hope you have an awesome rest of the day. Thanks, Anthony. Folks, thank you for joining us today on today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Thank you, Laura, for being my guest today. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and I encourage you to not only look at yourself and how you can build the right team, but as Laura had suggested, you know, look at the things that you're putting in place and make sure that you're supporting your people and, and at driving the objective. Sometimes we do things and we do them because we want to be busy, not necessarily because it's going to drive the result. That's a good opportunity for you to step back and say, hey, are the things I'm putting in place getting the result that I want? And if not, you might want to change your tactic. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. I'll see you next time.